Welcome back. Um, to say the least, we have a treat today. We have Representative Marty Coley and we have Executive Director of Early Learning Coalition, Lynn Eldridge, on the show today. Um, both a couple of my most favorite people, frankly, because they both are extremely optimistic. They're positive. They're a joy to um, discuss um, uh, what is going on in the world. Uh, you know, Marty has the um, uh, just enough of that innate politician in her that she, <laughs> she, again, she presents that rosy side all the time, which is what I'm all about. And Lynn, obviously you know Lynn by now, and Lynn is all about children, number one, uh, all about people, certainly. And, uh, and again, we're, we're in for an interesting treat today uh, in this discussion. We're going to be talking about kids. We're going to be talking about how the Florida legislature perhaps uh, comes into play in that scenario. And just, in general, have a very good conversation. You're watching Real Florida Magazine, and if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show, or maybe there's something you'd like to see featured, just give us a call, drop us an email, or visit our website at realfloridamagazine.org. We'll be right back with more from Real Florida Magazine. <laughs> Welcome back. As mentioned, um, we've got a very good, interesting show today. Representative Marty Coley and Executive Director of Early Learning Coalition, Lynn Eldridge. We've been trying for a while to get you on the show. Lynn um, always carves out the time when we have the ability to have her in the general area. So thank you for taking the time today. Today was an exciting time. We did a walkthrough on one of the child care providers. Um, Lynn, I'm going to let you start off. Talk a little bit about what we did today. Um, we're going to be showing some B-roll footage while you're talking. Thank you. Talk about what we're doing sure. today and in association yeah. with Marty, certainly. We are so grateful to have Representative Coley coming to walk through and view the educational system in a private small business child development center. Uh, Kids World uh, Early Learning Center, we uh, in Chipley, Florida, we were able to go through and talk to a parent who actually has her child there, and also talk to teachers who work there and help educate the young children. And we got to see birth to five, children birth to five years old, and even in the infant room, they were reading to babies. And I think that is certainly something that Representative Coley left those four-year-olds with. I, I heard her as we began to walk away, Paul. She said, with four-year-olds huddled all around her, remember, I have a secret for you. And when she said the word secret, they got closer. She said to them, read and read and read. And if you do, you can be anything you want to be. What a powerful message coming from someone like our representative. And we're so grateful to have her in our community touting the power of our community, our small business providers, and the field of early learning. Marty, you bring with you a heritage um, as a teacher, and certainly you're steeped in the educational system. So what better match for us, certainly as a community, but with Early Learning Coalition? Talk a little bit about what we did today and, and, and the importance of that in our, in our community. Well, we all know that uh, learning begins at home. And that is extremely important. What I saw today was, was a, a, a facility that was much more than just a facility. It was almost an extension yes. of the home where there was loving and nurturing going on. There were, the children were playing. They were interacting. They were reading. Uh, I, as I walked into the, the infant's room and the teacher was sitting on the floor with was a couple of infants on her lap reading to them. I thought, you know, I remember doing that with my own children that's at right. home. And that's exciting because we do live in a day and time when uh, families are, are working hard and, and, and both parents usually find themselves in the workplace. Not always, but often. And it is important yes. that we have, uh, we have individuals, not just facilities, but we have people that are, are really caring and nurturing for those children, yes. providing much more than that, and, and beginning education even at, at that very young age. One thing that really stands out to me, you walk into these classrooms full of um, three to five-year-old kids, because prior to that, there, there's not a whole lot of interaction um, as far as me walking in as a stranger, but they're not 
full of trepidation when a stranger yeah. walks in. They're used to being around people. Yeah. They're used to interacting, and, and that's really strong. Um, many it's times, strong. It, that's not the case. Right. So in those environments, you've got all the education going on, but you've also got that social interaction. That, so that, important. That, that, uh, yeah, and uh, right. Lynn, um, we are fortunate enough to be able to do some work with you and, right. and for you and through you, and, and um, part of our effort is um, that educational and awareness campaign, letting people know um, what it is you do, but more importantly, underlining that emphasis and underlying the importance of that pre-K education. Yes. Um, you pointed out reading, Marty. Talk a little bit about that. That's one of your passions, I know. <laughs> and it's one of Representative Absolutely. Coley's. I can tell that, and I, I do love it. And when she speaks about those babies being on those laps, we're really not talking about letter recognition or phonemic awareness, although we are building vocabulary in that baby's brain. But what we're talking about is a love for reading. When these babies are on the laps of someone they love and that person's reading to them, that is so powerful. It literally changes the chemistry of that baby's brain. And M Marty's right, we did this with our children. But so often our parents now are getting up. They have to be to work by 7 or 7.30. They don't get back home until 5 or 5.30. So they're picking their child up from the child care center. Many of our families are going to a second job. And so their child is in a second out-of-home environment. Are they bad parents? No, they're trying to work and make a living and make the best decision. Or go to school. We have a lot of parents in school. So when we recognize that when that parent brings that child to an early learning center, it is absolutely critical that there be a partnership between that program and that family so that much of what occurs in that early learning environment is something that you probably would typically have seen had they had the advantage of being at home and being outside together, playing in the pudding on the table, sorting silverware, all those things we might do at home. So the idea of it really does take a village to raise a child, it really takes an entire community and it takes the partnering of that community recognizing how critical a love of reading early on provide. Marty, you bring a personal interest, a, a personal level of dedication to, to the subject at hand. What is the state doing? Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about legislatively what, um, what is being done? I know that obviously ELC is funded uh, yes. in, in large part through the state. Absolutely. Can you give us just a thumbnail sketch of, of, the, of the sensitivity of, of the state to what subject is at hand? Well, I know over the last couple of years, we have continued to work on legislation that so would, would improve and strengthen the quality, the quality of the educational component to our early child care centers. There, there is so much that goes into, as I saw this morning, and, and even remembering back to when my children were small, there's so much that goes into uh, working with a child from from birth to five before they enter kindergarten. Part, mo a lot of it centers around play. But that's yes, important that you incorporate learning into uh, okay. and playing together. Absolutely. And so as we move forward with our policies in the state, we're, we, we're trying to be very careful and bring a balanced perspective where we understand that uh, as we make requirements, as we look at the school readiness component, it has to be balanced. We don't want to over-test, right. but we do want to have some uh, type of tools, mm -hmm. some type of assessments that will make sure that what we're doing Absolutely. all helps prepare that child to be ready to enter kindergarten. We're giving them the foundation upon which the, the elementary schools then can build. Exactly. And if we work That's together, if, if, and I, I keep hearing um, Lynn talk, use that word partnership, and I think that's the key. So from a state level, I think it's important that we create policies, we create account measurements and accountability, but that we don't over-regulate and over-intervene where these uh, become 
less nurturing. I just think that's an important component. So we have to, we're, we need to move carefully. We had a bill that went through legis, uh, the legislative session last session and was a compromise between early learning coalitions and child care providers to make sure that we're, we were hopefully reaching a, a good balance. It was vetoed by the governor, and so now we are beginning again. And I've had conversations with the governor's staff, with house staff, and uh, although I no longer chair the Education Committee as Speaker Pro Tem, I do have the flexibility to uh, participate, <laughs> I guess you could call it, any of these committees. So that, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to stay involved mm -hmm. and make sure that as we move forward, again, that we have the child. The child is the center. That is the focus. That all of our policies should be helping prepare that child but not over-regulating and overburdening. Lynn, um, you just recently were in Gulf County uh, yes. with, with a sister organization. Yes. How are things going? Um, I know that um, your programs certainly aren't diminishing. Um, it seems yes. like your funding is being kept up to a level that you're, you can be as effective as, maybe not as you'd like to be, but you're, yes. you're certainly right. doing a lot. Give us a thumbnail sketch of what, uh, of what ELC is doing these days. Well, we, we are very grateful to have the funding we have. And uh, last year, this time last year, we were looking at, come July, another $600,000 cut on top of a 400000 that we'd had. However, that's not going to happen. And we're so very grateful for that. That was based on how we determine how many dollars go to the different coalitions or the communities. As you know, Paul, we represent seven counties. And so uh, six of those very rural counties. And the funding makes such a huge difference in order to try to keep parents working. And, and very simply said, parents who are working and yet they're still earning 150% of the federal poverty level or under, about $4,000 a person in their home. It's very difficult for them to pay what it costs for childcare services today. And especially because many of our accredited programs, nationally accredited, keep lower ratios or how many children I can take care of per one adult. Well, when that happens, these uh, parents struggle with having to make decisions. Do I buy gas? Do I pay rent? Do I pay child care? And what happens is because we have the funding, federal and state funding, and, and Representative Coley has always been an advocate for us, that allows us to serve a parent on a sliding fee scale. And so everybody pays something. That's, that's important. This is their child's education and their care. Everybody pays something, but it's affordable because now instead of it, if you have an infant and you have a preschooler, it's $250 a week. So if you're bringing home $300, it doesn't stretch very far. But with the support of these funds, we're able, that parent then pays maybe $13 a week or seven or whatever based on what they earn. And so that keeps them feeling like they're taking care of their family and that family is core to that child's success. I'd love to say it's all about us, but it's really not. It's first that family and that child. And then, Paul, we work with private small businesses, child care providers in each of the community who are vested in their community, have been doing this, most of them, for years and years. Their life savings are in their programs, and they care about their community and these families. So we don't come in as a coalition and try to, to operate child care centers. We work with them. We partner with them. And we are also trying to keep that balance of recognizing, and you heard Representative Coley use that word quality. Well, if you said that to five people, we'd all probably had to have five different answers. But she tagged on with the word education. And we are clear that there are three things that focus on a quality education. We know that's knowing how children grow and learn, professional staff development. We also know that that looks at where is a child learning at? How are they processing? That's child assessments and screenings. And then what are we teaching them? That's a reliable and valid research-based curriculum. So those are three things that their policies have put into place for school readiness and VPK, voluntary pre-kindergarten. 
The difference there is school readiness programs, you must be working and earning 150% of the federal poverty or below to be eligible for support, financial support to help you with your child care program. Voluntary pre-K, the only eligibility is that child has to be four on or before September 1, and you must be a resident of Florida. So two different programs with two different eligibilities, both of them because of the policies, and these are fairly recent, I'd say the last seven, eight years, that the policies that have been put into place do not just address that four-year-old but they recognize that if we're not working with the three-year-old or the two-year-old or that baby, they are not going to be any more ready at four than they would have been otherwise. So uh, keeping that balance of trying to partner so that providers can still make a living, but holding all of us accountable, as Representative Coley said, to that child that sits in the center and must have the best start they possibly can to be successful when they enter kindergarten. We always run out of tape before Lynn <laughs> runs out of passion. <clears throat> you know, regardless of the best intentions that you might have, regardless of the best machine that you have in place, without help it's so true. at the state level, it's so true. as you point out, you, you dodged a bullet for over half yep. a million dollars. Marty, recently, um, we were the winner. We got a kiss. Uh, we, we, we acquired you as our representative yes. here in Washington County. Right. Uh, we also uh, had the fortune of uh, acquiring Steve Sutherland. Yes. Uh, as our representative. Um, thank you for all that you do. Um, Absolutely. You, uh, you, know, you, you may be from Jackson County. You spend an awful lot of time over here. There's no, there's no doubt in anybody's mind in Northwest Florida that you don't have all of Northwest Absolutely Florida's best right. interest at heart. So but we really appreciate you here in yes, Washington County, particularly. Um, what's going on uh, financially, fiscally? Lots of heartburn, lots of uh, negativity. <laughs> We're eternal optimists. Our job is to is to portray our clients in that best possible light. So that's our job. But I think by nature we are that way. Realistically, what, what's it look like uh, a year out, five years out, ten years out? You know, just give me your, your candid thoughts. All right. And before I do that, I, I would like to make one final comment on the the coalition and the early learning and that whole that whole subject matter. I want to make sure that we we get the message too that we are not trying to replace the home. That's and right. And this is it's so true. We're not Can't saying mandatory that every child no. should should go through, but we're saying that when children have to be in early learning child care centers, right. then we need to make sure that we're Absolutely providing them right. the best quality that we possibly can. I just felt like that was important to say. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and well said. And you know, That's right. we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> we have to recognize the fact that we do have many single parent homes. Yes, right. we do. We have some no parent homes. One of That's the exactly uh, one right. of the uh, guardians that we had today at the um, at the daycare uh, was actually an aunt who was yes. raising a three year old child. Wow. Yes. You get to the stage in life where you're a grandparent sometimes great-grandparent, and all of a sudden you find yourself right. raising yes, a child of that age. That's right. The dynamic there is just, it, it, it right. flummoxes me. I, right. I can't imagine. I have a hard enough time raising our 30-year-old kids. <laughs> um, so, but you're exactly right. And, yes. and we can appreciate that distinction. Yes. And, and I guess that, and I'm glad you said it, because overall that's part of our awareness campaign to let people know, whoa, 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 we're not saying we're big Absolutely. brother and telling you what to do. No way. We are giving you those tools. Right in order to, to expect the best outcome from, mm -hmm. from your children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why private providers are also very important because right. parents need options. They need they choices. They need to find the right fit for their, their child. And, so and, I, that's, and that's very good because we've spent time in the office at ELC mm -hmm. in Panama City, and that's one of the very first things that they let the, mm -hmm. the parent know. We're not telling you uh, with whom you have to deal. We're not right. telling you what business to, to frequent. You don't even have to be in the same town you live in. You can, you know, within reason, but we want you to have the, the good fit, the perfect right, match absolutely. for your mm -hmm. child. And if you would, do you remember my question? Yes, okay. uh, <laughs> and looking forward with the 2013 legislative session, in the last two sessions, we have entered session with a, at least a $2 billion shortfall. Mm -hmm. we are not, we're not facing that this year. We're looking at possibly, possibly a, a, a small additional revenue uh, the numbers are not firm, but we are hopeful that, uh, that by the time we actually begin uh, crunching the numbers, so to speak, that we will be uh, 
at least much better off than we have the last two years. Now, Approaching a balanced budget even? Well, no, we have balanced every year. Okay. We, we have a constitutional mandate right. in our state constitution that we must balance our budget every year. We do not operate like the federal government. <laughs> We must balance our budget. That's so for our why, viewers, explain what you mean by that shortfall. Why, if, if we had, last year we had uh, a little over $70 billion budget. This year, just to budget what we did last year, we would have to have that amount of money. In the last couple of years, we had uh, a projected, to be able to meet what we had budgeted the year before, we were short like, $2 billion. Gotcha. So we had to make up for that in some way. And we did that by looking at how we spend our money and taking programs that were not necessary in a tough budget time, reducing them or some even eliminating them. We are hopeful this year that we will not have to cut. We, we have cut and cut and cut. And so people are they have learned to live within their means. We've, I feel like our, our schools, our health care, we've all had to pull together mm -hmm. and, and realize efficiencies. Our state agencies have, have worked very hard to live within their means, and that it's been difficult, but we've done it. The positive side of that is it forces everyone to find and eliminate waste. That's true. And that is very important. True. So as we approach the budget this year, uh, we have seen the governor's proposal, and he has proposed to add additional monies to education and uh, with, with raises, raises specifically going to teachers. And although we are not opposed to raises going to teachers, we have to remember that the process is we allocate the districts, then go through collective bargaining and decide on, on the, the formula. Uh, because each county pays their teachers the different sure. uh, uh, salaries. So as we approach this year's budget, we are hopeful that we, we won't have a shortfall this year, that we might have a slight increase, ever, ever so slight. And, but that doesn't mean that we still won't look for waste. If there are areas of waste, we need to continue eliminating that. Then we need to uh, to focus on our core mission. What is our core mission? You know, our education, mm -hmm. the public education. Uh, what we are faced with many challenges with the health care mm -hmm. mandate coming down from the federal government. We have committees both in the Senate and in the House studying, analyzing, researching, crunching numbers, doing everything they possibly can to figure out how we are going to meet the requirements of the federal health care mandate. It will affect businesses uh, in many different ways, and it will even affect the state government. Uh, we have many employees. So all of those are not quite finalized. We are working on them. They're holding public hearings, and, and that will affect the overall end game for the budget. So it's way too early to tell you, oh, I see you know, increases going here, increases mm -hmm. going there. Sure. It's way too early. But I can tell you that we are working diligently. We are holding committee meetings. Matter of fact, we go back this week. As soon as I leave here, I will head to Tallahassee because we will continue to hold committee meetings. Uh, we have a budget appropriations committee meeting tomorrow afternoon. And we will, we will work within the revenues we have available. We have committed not to raise taxes on our, our citizens or fees. Uh, we know that families are facing tough times, and they certainly don't want the government to reach in and say, oh, we want more of your money. Mm -hmm. We have got to continue lear learning to uh, be more efficient with the tax dollars that we have, and I think with that we've shown that we've, we can do that. Uh, policy decisions are equally as important. You know, we've been talking about early learning today. Uh, although there is a funding formula that is being worked on mm -hmm. even as we speak, mm -hmm where to make sure that the, the funding allocation is fair, not only in rural communities, right. but in, in urban areas where population is, is much greater. Uh, that funding formula is very important, and that is being revisited, and, and, uh, and hopefully we'll come up with a, a sound funding formula. But, but as important as that is the policy that moves forward as well. 
Uh, we're looking at quite a few things. I, early learning, again, is being reevaluated. We've got a couple of uh, ideas that are, are being worked on in the house. Uh, I have gotten behind a move to, to see if we can create different pathways to a standardized diploma. As I heard on the campaign trail, here in Washington County, Holmes County, uh, Walton County, Jackson, was the need to help all students be ready for either college or career. Mm -hmm. So that if they are going into college, we need to make sure that they are ready. If they decide they're not going into college, maybe not right out of high school, then we need to make sure they have the skills necessary to enter the workforce. And so I, I'm excited about some of the policy uh, issues that are moving forward, and, and I'm hopeful that the budget will be uh, much easier this year. You know, we've, we've talked about if, whether, if there's an increase, whether we can give state employees raises. Uh, they haven't had one in six years, and that's been tough. Mm -hmm. That's been really tough. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're hoping to, uh, to use the taxpayer dollars efficiently and wisely, keep us out of trouble like other states, like California, and then mm -hmm. we can make mm -hmm. the list. The list is long. I, and I take away a positive message there. I, I take away a very positive outlook there. One man's necessity is another man's pork. Um, they're all tough decisions. And, and every single decision you make is tough Absolutely. on or for somebody. somebody. We're not in Kansas anymore. That's right. And the, the faster we can assimilate that fact, the, the faster we can accept mm -hmm. the fact that the good old days are just that. They're gone. Okay. And, and we'll never see some of those times. We, ba we baby boomers are extremely... Uh, spoiled. Yes. Um, the the nursing home industry right now taking a total change because those of us in the those that are baby boomers who are now getting ready to retire, we're demanding the ability to go parasailing when we're in that <laughs> in that assisted living facility or to go deep sea fishing seriously. And so we happen to work with Signature, uh, uh, who is a series of uh, of uh, healthcare facilities up the East Coast, and they do lots of trips and and they are offering amenities that before you'd say, is that a cruise ship or is that a nursing right. facility? <laughs> so, so the point is, things are changing. Right. Yes. Again, thank you for all that you bring to the table. Absolutely. I think that you bring a skill set and, and, a, and a heritage, uh, particularly the educational uh, component of that, that really does us well. I know that um, you're a huge partner to, uh, to ELC and, and to Lynn. Oh, yes. um, you can speak to Lynn for three minutes and know the depth of her passion. Right. She wears it on her sleeve. She doesn't hide it. Um, and she professes it. She lives it. She's made a believer of us. One thing you did mention was that alternative to the, fo the typical four-year college. We have the fortune of working with Washington Homes Technical Center. Right. Again, an awareness uh, uh, campaign, letting people know what they offer. You were here with the governor, uh, with Rick Scott, uh, several months ago, had a, had a meeting uh, at uh, Patillo's restaurant right there on the Tech Center campus. And um, there was some conversation about the fact that, you know, we're in that boomerang generation. 35 or 40 percent of the kids graduating college and moving back home with mom and dad and living on them. They can't find a job. He commiserated. He said, my own daughter just graduated with an anthropology degree. Can't find a job. She's come back home to live. Um, we have some wonderful tech facilities. You've got uh, uh, Haney in, in Panama City. Chipola offers a, a plethora of those and Washington Homes Technical nice. Center for over here. Uh, they're not really competing. Sometimes you have similar classes and, and some of that has to be adjusted because we don't want true competition. But you know, when gas is $4 a gallon um, and I live in Chipley, well, it doesn't really make sense for me to go to one of those other schools, That's even nice. if you were charging half the cost because right. that gas just eats you up. I know that you have been working with the, uh, the legislature, um, with, um, uh, with the business community in private uh, and uh, uh, other organizations to, uh, or with those organizations to, uh, whether it's the job force or one stop or to try to find out what is the best path to take. There's no answer. There is no right answer. We can only tweak what we do over time and hopefully get better along. Again, thank you for your passion. It comes through. Um, and and I, I think that our viewers would agree that we have a, a couple of young ladies here right now who um, 
It's a pleasure, certainly, to, to talk to you. You can both give me bad news, and it still sounds good to me. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like talking to somebody with a British accent. It, it all sounds good. Cuss me out, it still sounds good. Uh, but thanks again for taking the time. I know you've got a very tight schedule, so we, we're particularly thankful for you carving out the time today. Lynn, as always, um, thank, you. thank you for, for being an over honor here to today. Be with Representative Coley. Thank you. It was a great day today. Um, as we go out, we're going to show you some clips taken today uh, with uh, Representative Coley reading to the children. Um, that was fun. Having some fun. Yeah. How do you how fun. do you call that work? That uh, was fun. Uh, it's all good. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, our guests today have been Representative Marty Coley and Executive Director of the Early Learning Coalition, Lynn Eldridge. You're watching Real Florida Magazine, and we will be right back. There's a rumble in the jungle. There's a whisper in the trees. The animals are waking up and rustling the leaves. Can you make the leaves ruffle, rustle? The hippos at the water hole, the leopards in his lair. The chimpanzees are chattering and swinging everywhere. Some animals are frightening and some are sweet and kind. So let's go to the jungle now and see who we can find. Uh-oh, here we go. We're gonna see who we can find. Are you ready? Oh,